Michigan of all places. <laughs> My wife is from Michigan. <laughs> Went to Michigan of all places um, to go to this seminary in this tiny little town. And as I was there, suddenly I had had this experience where it had become undeniably undeniable to me that there was this woman that I was in love with. And it was, it was, it was, um, you know what? I felt like I was losing my mind. I honestly felt like I was losing my ever-loving mind. It, it, it seemed like the most out-of-left-field, crazy, insane thing that could ever happen that I didn't believe, like I didn't even know. I remember wondering, like, where's the book for this? Like, where are the people who have been through this? And I felt unbelievably isolated and alone. But here I was at the seminary, and I'd kind of, you know, gone all in on going to seminary and being a pastor and changing my life. And so I'd, I'd worked my way kind of through that, and I'd gotten to the point where it seemed like I was doing okay, but there was this um, cognitive dissonance in my mind. There was this thing that wasn't making sense to me of I, I just I don't understand how this theology of rejecting what I had been mostly thought about as gay people and honest to God because self-deception is deep, I almost felt like that wasn't really me. So like um, of, of rejecting these, these, these gay people, but, but, but this is a loving God. And I knew, enough, I knew enough to know that some of the worst of the stereotypes weren't right and that they were wrong, and that these were real, genuine relationships. And I didn't really understand. And I, I, I you know, had studied it some in my Bible, and I'd studied it some in my classes, and I just I wasn't 100% okay with it. Well, um, we do camp meeting in the Adventist Church. I don't know if has anybody been to camp meeting before. All right. <laughs> <coughs> Everybody, or, or thousands of people from the state kind of descend on this big camp in Prescott. And they had put me in charge of um, the youth for the week. And so I was, I was running the youth department and really loving it. And it was kind of an amazing thing. I felt like I was being entrusted with a lot. And I was really, I was really loving it. I was getting to know these other young pastors who are just amazing people. It was a really good place to be. And then after that week of working, you know, 12, 14-hour days, and then um, we all kind of got up early like crazy people after that to go to breakfast together before we all went our separate ways. So here we are, a bunch of Adventist pastors sitting in a restaurant in Prescott, Arizona, eating breakfast, and as we're getting up, one of the pastors says to me, or one of the pastors says to the group, did you hear about the shooting last night? Um... And I hadn't heard about it. And there's so many shootings in this country. It's horrible. And then somebody said, yeah, it was at a gay nightclub. So if we could go to the next, yeah. And it had been the Pulse shooting. And I can tell you with um, the second I heard those words, my life was never the same again because it pushed over an edge to say this is not this is not okay something is deeply broken and wrong and part of the most difficult aspect of it for me was the lack of self reflection i saw in the conservative church i mean i was very aware when you're queer and closeted you remember every single thing anybody says about queer people you remember every single thing. And I was very aware of the kinds of things that were being said. I mean, I remember in the seminary chapel when the person described the men in Sodom and Gomorrah as a, a group of gay men who were going around the countryside raping people. You know, like I remembered all of these little offhand comments and things people said and, and just the lack of self-reflection. And when I saw the way my, my church and the other people in my community were responding to this event. Um, 
it just broke something inside me that said this dissonance is not okay anymore. I have to figure this out. I have to figure this out. Um, I think that I think that day affected a lot of us in a lot of ways. And the other crazy thing that happened to me um, through that experience is that for the first time, as I saw queer people responding, the very, very few people I knew on social media who were queer, I related so deeply to everything they were saying. You know, I'd never been to a gay nightclub. The whole community terrified me. Um, honestly, it was just like terrifying to think about being in the community. It was so different and unknown to me, but, and yet I could see, wow, like, I can feel connected to them and feel connected to what they're saying for the first time ever. So that led to a period of just revisiting my faith in a way that was um, really, really deep. And for me, that meant looking at the Bible again. Now, as a, as a Seventh-day Adventist, as with many conservative Christian denominations and evangelical denominations, um, I, I saw the scriptures as a source of, of authority in my life. And I, and I believed that it was a revelation of the will of God. And so I had to reconcile these things, and I had to wrestle with these things. And, as I did, something started to reveal itself to me as I read the scriptures, as I read books that people had written, and that was that there was there was always some, there was always some type of a, um, a little jump that was made between what was being described in the scriptures and what was being spoken of at the time that was happening and who actual queer people are in our community now and today. But um, I think, um, my relationship with the Bible has been in incredibly difficult because um, the Bible has been what has been used as the main source of oppression of queer people. And the church for queer people has been the oppressor. It used to be all of society, but now it's mainly and primarily the church that is the oppressor of queer people. And so this is the tension as I've tried to understand and learn more about scripture that I have, that I am very passionate about unraveling and figuring out is that what does queer liberation theology look like when for us the theology itself has been the source of our oppression? Theology itself has been the thing that has said to us, you're not okay. Um, so, I mean, spoiler alert, you probably figured this out already. I like came to the inclusion that like being queer was awesome. And um, <laughs> yeah, I eventually, yeah. So, so I eventually um, came out and decided to, to do it in the most explosive way I could manage. Um, I, you know, I, I was an Adventist pastor, so what are you going to do, sit down and have 500 conversations with, with individual people? Like, that just sounds awful. Um, you know, coming out means losing my job, how am I going to do this? And so I got connected with a friend who, um, uh, they're a couple and they're documentarians, they made a doc documentary called, get this, Seventh Gay Adventist? Yeah. So I got connected with them and they, they offered to film a coming out video for me. So um, I kind of resigned at my, my church, um, drove out to California, we did the video, um, I went and slept and they stayed up all night editing it like the wonderful people they are. I got up the next morning, um, worked some things out and uh, pushed send on the video, it was a 27 minute video. And um, 
within a matter of hours, everybody I'd ever known, everybody who I would have conceivably ever met in the Adventist church knew exactly who I was and what was going on. <laughs> and 50,000 people watched that video in the first month. Um, I don't know what it is now. And I started getting letters from people. Um, I started getting letters from queer people coming out to me. Um, dozens, maybe hundreds, I don't know, so many letters of people coming out to me, sharing their story, talking about their pain, talking about how much hope it gave them to have literally one person who said, yeah, I'm queer and it's okay. Literally one person in their lives. You can't imagine the isolation. And then I would get other messages of people just angry, like spewing Leviticus 18 and Romans 1 at me like I'd never come across those texts before. <laughs> like, wow. Oh, well, this changes everything. <laughs> I mean, <coughs> I don't, don't know what they expected, but... <laughs> but what you start to realize when you receive one after another, after another, after another of these is the energy that's behind them the energy of just the anger and the opposition that needs to go on this long bible -y tirade about how awful you are, how disgusting you are. Man, the things that people said to me were unbelievable. But one of the things I've come to realize through that and through the work that I've been doing since is that there is within the established theology that says it's not okay to be queer, there is an element of dehumanization that is present. I have never experienced um, someone who has articulated their theology in a way that does not dehumanize us on some level. And when I say dehumanize, what I mean is they look at us, our lives, and our experience, and decide that somehow fundamentally that is different than theirs. More than once, probably a half a dozen time, times I have had male pastors compare same-sex marriage to their porn addiction. And here's the crazy thing about it. They think that that's a gracious thing because they think that they are saying, I struggle with sin just like you do. And the only thing that makes that possible is dehumanization. To say you can be in a marriage without the normal human feelings of love and affection that we assume are in heterosexual marriages. So what does queer liberation theology mean when the church and when theology has become our oppressor? Queer liberation theology must mean liberation of the Bible and theology itself. It must mean a redemption even of the text and the scripture itself. I forgot to tell you to go to the next slide. Man, it's a cool one too. Um, it's the dehumanization that queer people experience in the church. It must mean a liberation of the text itself. And I have to tell you that I, I feel that sometimes, for those of us who end up on the more progressive side, we have a tendency not to actually liberate the text, but just to dismiss it. Because we don't know what to do with it. We don't know how to read it or what to do with it. And in a church like this, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but it happens on a regular basis that queer people come from their conservative churches and sit in these pews and they love their Bibles, and they're looking for answers, and they're trying to figure it out. And so the thing that I wonder about, the thing that I worry about, the thing that I'm passionate about, is are we ready for those conversations? Are we learning to love, respect, and liberate the scriptures at the same time so that we can bring the kind of redemption that the queer community really needs and the essence of what queer liberation theology really is. Thank you.